Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing awesome, awesome. I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to acquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me, he shall set me high upon a rock. King David, not, uh, not disparaging the problems, but realizing his source is in the Lord. And that's where we have to do. We have to turn our attention to the Lord, put our trust in the Lord. There's a lot of things going on in life today, in our world. And uh, just so you know, Pastor Rusty and Tish are away on vacation, so praying for them. They might even be watching right now. Who knows? Um, so beware. Pastor Rusty's always watching. Um, you know, I just, this past couple weeks, uh, I, we were away. I was preaching at the church last week. Um, but uh, over the past couple weeks, I've just been kind of inundated with uh, people facing serious problems. Um, yeah, I, I get to hear a lot as a, as a corporate chaplain. I, I interact with people a lot. But I'm talking about people, friends of mine, family members, just facing really, really, uh, some of them life-threatening situations. It's like, wow, Lord, this is kind of overwhelming. If we look at it in the natural, we've got to look to the Lord. And it just reminds us, we have to be a people of prayer, and a people of faith. And how many here today, you would say, you, either you or you know, you have family members that are going through very, very difficult, challenging times. Yeah, you know, yeah, most of us. Let's open with prayer. Would you just... Wherever, I'm not going to call you for it, but would you just stand up if you have a need either in your life or your family? Let's just stand. We're going to stand on the word. We're going to stand on behalf of other people. And we're going to be a people of faith knowing that, Lord, that the Lord is allowing these things to happen in our life. And we have to turn our attention to him. We've got to put our trust in the Lord. Heavenly Father, today as we stand before you, King of kings and Lord of lords, Lord, our hearts are comforted. Because we know that you are Lord. We're acknowledging today you're the Lord of our lives. You're the Lord of this world. A lot of things we don't understand. A lot of things, Lord, we don't like that are very uncomfortable for us. But we know this. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. And we know that the greater one, the greater one's inside of us. So thank you, Lord, that we pray on behalf of all these needs, Lord. Various uh, illnesses and tremendous financial difficulties and tremendous relationship situations. Oh, Lord, we call out to you because we know, Lord, that Jesus is the answer to every question, every need, no matter what it is. You're Lord of everything, and there's nothing out of your reach, nothing too difficult for you. You are the Lord, our healer. You are our Savior. You are our deliverer. As the psalmist said in Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who pardons all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases, who delivers me from destruction. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to acknowledge you. Now, Lord, today we honor you. We welcome your presence today, and we give praise to our King. Thank you that we can be lovers and worshipers and seekers of God. Lord, have your way today in our midst, that God will be glorified, that Jesus will be exalted. Holy Spirit, you would be allowed to move in our midst today. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Let everyone stand as we can lead this in worship.
blessed assurance, a song that just has timeless truths that all of us can recognize God's many blessings and God's hand, that we can be assured that he is with us, that he hears our prayers, and he's here to comfort us. We can enjoy him. Heavenly Father, thank you for constantly encouraging us, constantly comforting us. And Lord, probably most importantly, you're constantly drawing us to yourself. Thank you for that call, for that beckoning. And Lord, I, I know that you are speaking to people here today. We just say, Lord, have your way open up all of our ears to hear, God, what you're saying, what you want to do and accomplish in our lives. Thank you for the privilege to gather. Thank you for that blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. No matter what happens in the world, no matter what's going on around me, our eyes are fixed on you. Our trust is in you. As Paul says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for those comforting words. Thank you for the opportunity to rest in you today. Lord, we pray and we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. Sister Emily is coming now to give us an update on missions. She has a few announcements for us. to help prepare and protect prisoners from getting into the horrible game that's coming to New York. Today I just want to briefly tell you another wonderful ministry that you probably have never heard of, and we've had many Latin missionaries that come through here, the Bowsers and the Strange and uh, all of them, but do you know where they learn Spanish? Are you bilingual? How, how do you think those precious missionaries learn to be fluent in their language? In Costa Rica, they say it's a fabulous country. There is a wonderful language school by the Assemblies of God that every one of our missionaries, new missionaries, or those that need refresher courses Go there and diligently study for one whole year so that they can become fluent and go to the country that God has called them to. So we see El Salvador, what they're doing. Now we see in Costa Rica, what they're doing. So make sure you pray for our missionaries. Is it easy to learn a language? No way. So pray for them. Another exciting event that is coming up, if you would want to go to it, and I intend to, August 22 is a Sunday night. Our head missions man from Springfield, Brother Greg Mundus, will be at Radiant Light. And you know what they're going to be doing? They are going to be commissioning brand new missionaries to go on the field. That will be an exciting adventure just to be a part of that event. You have world missions and you have U.S. missions. I don't know how excited you are about missionaries, but I consider them my family. So, just make sure you keep
keep giving. Make sure you keep praying for our missionaries. I wanted to give you tonight's announcements. Nothing. Did you read your bulletin? Nothing. So you're free. Back to school Glasgow is coming up. And buddy, that's not going to be just laid back. That's going to be powerful. So I hope that you're going to be able to help our pastor's wife make sure everything is done well as the kids go back to school. And one reminder, and I notice sometimes Pastor goofs on this. <laughs> he dismisses and he doesn't take the offering. So I'm telling you now, get your offering in your hip pocket, and when Rick dismisses us, you know what to do with your offering. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Emily. She is one of a kind. Who said thank God? <laughs> we appreciate it. We love Sister Emily. A couple things that um, didn't get to, we got to kind of last minute. I wasn't sure if it was public knowledge, but next Saturday uh, there will be a service for Herschel uh, Bolton will be held here at the church, viewing at 1 o'clock, and then the service at 2 for visitation at 1 o'clock. Uh, service at 2 p.m. here at the church, so you are all, I assume everybody's invited because it's in here, right? So we'll make sure, hopefully it wasn't. And then the following Sunday, the 22nd, after the service, we'll have a special uh, business meeting, um, some special, uh, something that's changed for our bylaws, so just those couple add-ons. Anyway, so glad you're here. We're going to go ahead and dismiss the children and all the children's workers can go back um, to the children's church. You're about God there. We are going to continue in our series today, looking at the, the heroes of the faith. And uh, as I was looking at the different people in the Bible, you know, whether you're talking about a Rahab, who Pastor Russi talked about a few weeks ago, or a, a Ruth, uh, or a, a David, or a Daniel, they all seem to have this this commonality that they were they were kingdom-minded people. They had a, what I call a kingdom mentality. They were just aware of God's kingdom and his presence. And it's sort of like recently, uh, we bought a, a, actually a used car, but uh, we're looking at cars, and then once you get one, you, know, you pick out something, you know, all of a sudden you see it everywhere. You know, like, oh, there's one, oh, there's one, there's one. You, know, just, you just kind of see it because you're kind of looking for it. And I think it's the same way with the kingdom of God. Um, I've just also kind of, God brought that to my attention, and Look, and it's just everywhere, especially in the, the Gospels. Uh, kingdom, actually, in, in Matthew, it's, it's said, called Kingdom of Heaven because Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience, and Jewish people were very careful about even saying the name God. So they talk about the Kingdom of Heaven. But the other occurrences in the Synoptic Gospels are, are Kingdom of God. I think there's all like 110 times where, where Jesus or the disciples mentioned uh, about the Kingdom of God. So it's everywhere in Scripture. So these people of faith that we're kind of looking to as an example for us, they had that kingdom mentality. And just very briefly, uh, following along in your uh, there's a little outline on the back of you if you want to follow along or to uh, make notes. Or some people, I know they, they do like to doodle. That's fine. Whatever is you know, good for you to keep you engaged. But uh, the first fill in the blank is when we talk about God's kingdom, is that now, now is the time. Now is the time of God's kingdom. Not something tomorrow. It's right here. It's right now. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Mark writes it this way. It says, now after John, talking about the John the Baptist, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, it's here. It's God is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. So when we talk about a kingdom, there has to be a king, right? If we talk about a kingdom, there's got to be a king. It means somebody that, that, that reigns, somebody that rules, at least somebody that has authority. And we as, I'll just say as a kind of blind state, we as Americans, we struggle with that. We kind of struggle because we declared our independence, right? We didn't want the king of England telling us what to do. And obviously there's bad kings and bad rulers. And a lot of times today, 
from kings and presidents, there's dictators around the world. But that idea of absolute authority is of God. That's the way God's kingdom rules. He, he is the king. And there's no, let's vote on it. Or let's, well, let's, can I ask some other people what they think? No, it's what God's word says. God's word is his standard. And so you, if you're struggling with it, jo you know, join the crowd. We all do. But he is king and he is Lord. Now, he's a loving God. He's a father and all those other aspects. But he is the king. And what Jesus was announcing, the same thing that John the Baptist read in Matthew chapter 3 when John the Baptist comes on the scene the first recorded words we have of John the Baptist in, in Matthew 3 he said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand in other words it's here and then Jesus obviously reinforced that so we need to understand that the kingdom of God is going on right here right now and that we to, to enter it to enjoy the kingdom aspects is that we have to be born again John 3 3 again Jesus said unless man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So people in the world can't see it before they have a relationship with the Lord. You have to know the Lord to be able to see God's kingdom and how it operates. Thirdly is that Matthew 6, probably, for me, probably be my life verse. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. Probably for me personally, it was something I was always seeking, some type of significance, some type of success in life. And there is no significance. There is no success apart from God. He is the ultimate barometer. He is the, the true test of success. So we have to seek. And again, we have to seek and we have to do something. We can't have, I've had people say, you know, well, you know, if God wants to do this in my life, I'm open to it, but I'm not. No, we, I think we have to press in. I think we can't make it. I can't make it happen. But I think we have to seek after the things of God. Amen. So now is the time. We have to be born again. We have to seek it. And then lastly, I think we have to pray. We have to pray for it. When the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, John, you know, he taught his disciples, Would you teach us how to pray? But he starts off, you know, your kingdom. He said, the, um, <coughs> Pray that our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We have to pray in the kingdom in our lives. Theologians talk about the kingdom of God. They say the kingdom of, kingdom of God is already, but not yet. What, what does that mean? It's already. God is already ruling and reigning. His kingdom is here. It's present. Jesus ushered that in dramatically with his ministry. But it's not yet evident on earth. God is ruling in the universe. He rules everywhere. But it's not evident. When Jesus comes back, it will be evident here on earth. His kingdom will be uh, already, and then it will be, yeah, it will be here. So we have to really develop that same, if we want to be all that God has called us to be. And that's why we're looking at these different people in the Bible, these heroes of the faith. We're looking at what they did. And the Bible tells us in Corinthians that they were given to be an example to us. God doesn't hide their failures. You know, none of these people did it perfectly, right? They were human beings like you and I, but it's meant to be an encouragement to us. So we're going to look at somebody today that's a little bit, probably a little bit odd. Uh, some of you uh, have probably heard of him. So some of you probably have not. His name is Obed-Edom, and I picked him because of this name. I like the name Obed-Edom. It's just kind of, a catchy, kind of a catchy name. But he had a very unique life and a very unique testimony. And there's a connection between Obed-Edom, that we're going to look at today, a man who recognized an opportunity, a very unique opportunity, and also recognized that there was a connection to the, the Ark of the Covenant. You've probably heard about that, especially if you've ever watched any of the Harrison Ford, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that type of stuff. But we're talking about that Ark, not Noah's Ark, not the boat. We're talking about the Ark that God designed. And I kind of feel a prompting before we get into to pray, so let's just pause to... to uh, Call on the Lord again. Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to, for, as your people to look into your kingdom principle, to look into your word. And we recognize, Lord, that uh, I know that I cannot explain it without your help. I cannot impart. Holy Spirit, you're the one that opens up hearts. You're the one that brings to life the word of God. So we invite your influence. We invite your presence. And we just pray that, uh, Lord, your purposes would come to pass today. And everyone, and, and everyone that's here today that's hungering and asking, God, that you will meet them right where they're at, and they will experience the peace and presence of God. 
All right, just a little bit about the, uh, the Ark, just a little bit of history. What is this Ark of the Covenant? Well, it's something that in about 1500 B.C., God gave Moses instructions when they were in the desert. There's a picture of it up there. He gave, he gave Moses the instructions of how to, to make this Ark. And what the Ark represents, it represents the presence of God. And we don't worship the Ark, but the Ark represents God's presence. And it's about... Four feet long, it's about two feet wide, about two feet deep, and it's covered with gold. And you'll notice there are a couple rings on the side, there are poles to go through. It's supposed to be carried by priests with the poles. No, you're not supposed to touch it. Okay, that's a key thing. You don't touch, you don't touch God's presence, you don't touch his ark. Uh, the Bible says you don't touch his anointed ones. But so Moses, at God's instruction, made it in 1500 BC when they were out in the wilderness. Now they come out of Egypt and God showed them how to make the tabernacle, where they're going to worship God, and he shows them how to make the ark. So from 1500 B.C. to 1100 B.C., Israel had the ark. In 1100, King Saul uh, didn't obey God. He turned away from God. Israel turned away from God, and they were defeated in battle. And when they lost, the ark was captured by the Philistines. Okay? So Israel no longer had the ark in their possession. The Philistines had the ark. They brought it into their city. They brought it into a city called Ashdod, probably their capital. They're on the coast. And they put it in their temple because the peoples back then, they believed in multitudes of gods. That's what's so unique about Israel. That's what's so unique about the God of Israel. He's the only true and living God. There's not multitudes of gods. He's the only true God. And that's what made the Israeli people, the Jewish people, different. <laughs> they believed in one true God. So the Philistines bring it in. They put it in their temple with their other god, um, Dagon. And next morning, there's a little story. They get up, and they go in their temple, and there's the ark, and their God is on, on the ground. He's in the dirt. He's fallen over. The idol's fallen over. So they put him back up on the shelf, and they go, huh. And they wait, and the next day, they walk in there, and he's down in the dirt again, except this time, his head is severed, and his hands are severed. So he's got no hands, he's got no head. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of tumors that are breaking up. People are getting sick. People are dying. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. The Philistines, hey. This, we weren't having these problems before this ark came. We're going to get rid of the ark. So they sent it to another city. They would send it to a city named Gath. And so the ark goes to another Philistine city. You'll, that name Gath will come up a little bit later. So it goes there, and the same thing happens, right? People start getting, getting tumors. People start dying. And they, people realize, hey, we weren't having this problem until the presence of God comes. You know, the presence of God is good. If you're serving him and honoring him, it could be deadly not. Just ask, ask Ananias and Sapphira, right? Um, you know, we all, we want revival. We, we do. We need a spiritual awakening. But just know when the presence of God comes, whoa, I better make sure my life is measuring up. I better make sure I'm living that holy life because the presence of God cuts both ways, right? It cuts both ways. So all of a sudden the people gather realize, hey, we weren't having a problem. Get rid of this ark, okay? So they send the ark down to another Philistine city called Ekron. People of Ekron go, no, you don't. They go, no, no, no. We, we, you know, good news travels fast. Bad news travels faster, right? They didn't have social media. They didn't have cell phones. But that news traveled. And so those people said, you are not bringing that. We already heard what happened in the other cities. So it's not coming in here. So they, uh, they designed this plan. They put it on a, on a, on a, a wagon and they put some oxen. They said, okay, if it goes back to Israel, we'll know that that was the God of Israel against it. Yes, this, if it just starts to wander around, well, it just happened. It just happens to us. they put it on the wagon, and the sheep head straight for Israel. And they go to a town named Beth Shemesh, which is a Jewish town in Israel territory. And the people are all excited. Hey, we got the ark back. Praise God. The ark's come back, and blah, blah, blah. But they made a mistake. They touched the ark. They opened up the ark to see what was inside. This is 50,000 people in Beth Shemesh dying because they touched present, they touched the ark of God. So they uh, they were all upset and uh, they decided, okay, you can't stay here. You can't stay here. And so uh, we're going to pick up a story in 1 Samuel. Um, people in, in kiriath Jerem, uh, another Jewish town, they come to get the ark. So 1 Samuel 7, 1, we got it. Excellent. Then the men of kiriath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill, and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So, 
The story goes that the Ark stayed there for 20 years. He stayed 20 years with Abinadab. He had three sons. One was Eleazar, who was a, who was a, a priest. He also had another son. His son's name was Ohio. That's where we get the name Ohio from. from his... yeah, that's, that's a joke. But anyways, his son's name was A-H-I-O, Ohio. And then he had a third son named Uzzah. Does that ring a bell? Uzzah? Anyways, the Ark was there for 20 years. David gets established in his kingdom. He says, hey, we're in Jerusalem here. We, we need the Ark. So let's go get the Ark. Everybody gets excited about it, right? So they traipse down to, um, to Kiriath Jerem. They, they get the Ark. They put it on, on an ox cart. Hmm, first mistake, right? That's not the way it's supposed to be transported. They're transporting it. The oxen stumble. In the story, Uzzah, one of the three sons, Right of Abinadab, he puts his hand out to protect the ark, and he dies. Right? Now sometimes, even us as believers, we can get too familiar with God. We can get too comfortable with God. He thought he was helping God out by touching the ark, but he was disobeying God. So there are 20 years. Sometimes, you know, we could be in the church for a long time, but we can get too comfortable. God. We, can, we can get God to kind of be a tame God, that he just kind of does what we think he should do and uh, doesn't do things differently. He doesn't challenge us, but he does. He does. So, that happens in, in King David. Now he's mad. King David is very upset. He's saying, hey, we're coming, we're doing a good thing. We're coming to get the ark. We're coming to bring God's presence to Jerusalem. And Lord, you do this. And he gets offended. You ever get offended at God when something doesn't work out right? Something with your health, something with a family member, something with work. You know, God, hey, I prayed and you, you didn't do it right. Right? We want him to do things our way. So we can get offended at God too. So Uzzah was just a little too familiar with the things of God. And so David says, all right, forget it. We're not bringing it to Jerusalem. For some reason, he took it to our, our star of the story. He took it to Obed Edom's house in 2 Samuel. Chapter 6, verses 10 11. So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. The Gittite just means that you're a resident of Gath. And again, Gath, that town we talked about before, was a town in, in the Philistine area, but there were Jewish people living all over. They weren't just solely in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, they were all over. So they took it to Gittite, and the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. This is amazing. In three months, people recognize, hey, something's going on in Obed-Edom's house. Something's going on. It only took three months. It was 20 years in Abinadab, and we got nothing. Three months. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from Obed-Edom? Well, first of all, again, in your, your outline then, Obed-Edom, he says yes. He had to know it was a risky situation. He had to know the story that Uzzah has just died for touching it. He had to have heard when 50,000 people died back then in a town in Beth Shemesh, he had to have known about that. That was a long time ago, but he had to be aware. And, you know, it is risky serving God. It is risky going after the things of God. But I have to ask myself, what's the alternative? Right? So we, as people, are literally between a rock and a hard place. If I don't do nothing, it's going to be bad news. If I do something for God, ah, I'm putting my trust in him, and I don't, I don't, he doesn't always do things the way I want him to do. Right? But Obed Eden goes ahead and he says, yes. Yeah. Secondly, think about it. Obed-Edom had a personal request from the king. King David came to him and asked him to take that ark, take God's presence into his home. He had a personal. Everybody here today, if you know the Lord, you had a personal invitation from the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe, the God of history, whatever you want to call him, the great I am. He gave you a personal invitation to know him. 
walk with him. The king asked you, like the king David asked Obed-Edom. Next we look at that this was the opportunity of a lifetime. Fill in the blank there is a lifetime. Opportunity of a lifetime. Only two people in history had the ark in their home. And Obed-Edom was one of them. Here's a guy. He lives in Gath. It's a very rural area, right? It's kind of out there. It's almost like, well, it's not so much anymore, but, but the Tascala, that used to be, I remember when I was in school in the, in the 80s, Ohio State, Tascala, that was out in the woods. You know, that was like nowhere. Can anything good come out of the Tascala? Yeah, Jack Barnett. I mean, how about Frazysburg? Where in the world is Frazysburg, right? Right? All these little towns, but God knows exactly where you're at. He knows where you're from. He knows your history. He knows your calling. He has a purpose for you. So little Obed-Edom out there in the middle of nowhere, God put his finger on his life. And he responded. And he responded. Now the ark talks about the ark, the, the contents. And I think it's significant for us. You say, well, what's about this ark? We don't have it. Some people claim to have it hidden somewhere. We, we don't know. But in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus as the high priest and how he fulfilled his role. And it talks about the ark. And so in Hebrews 9, 3, it's talking about the most holy place because when you went inside the tabernacle, there was a place called the most holy. It's where that big, remember that big curtain that they had? Well, behind it was the most holy place that the, only the high priest went in there only once a year and only after he had cleansed himself. They literally had to tie ropes around him because if you went in there, you weren't, you weren't totally serving God and you had impurities in your life. There would be priests that would die because of God's holiness, and they would have they couldn't go in there, so they had to drag him out with the ropes. So it was kind of a nerve-wracking thing. But in that area, there's only two items. One was the golden censer, and one was the Ark of the Covenant. That's where we pick up the 9-4. So in the most holy place, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets the covenant. So three things were found in that ark. Three things were found in that presence of God. And how those relate to us? Well, obviously the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, relate to the Word of God. And you and I, we need the Word of God. We need the Word of God to be central in our lives. We need to put the Word of God as the standard. We need to renew our mind with the Word of God. All of us come into life with a certain family background, whatever that was, a certain cultural background, and we have ways of thinking it looking at things that are contrary to God's ways. And so that's why we have to read, study, and meditate on the Word of God. So those tablets, the Word of God was in God's presence, the golden pot that used to have the manna. Remember, the manna represented how God provided daily for his people in the wilderness. <coughs> so it reminds us that we have to look to the Lord. The Lord is my provider. Thankful for wherever I work, who are my employers, but they're not my provider. Well, I can lose that job, right? If God's my provider, he'll take care of me. One way or another, right? One way or another. And then there was Aaron's rod. Remember that Aaron's rod was the one that God, to show that Aaron was the priestly line, they put all these rods, one from each 12 of the, of the 12 tribes inside the ark, and they took them out the next day, and Aaron's rod had actually budded almonds. And there was life in that rod. That's the same rod that he threw down right in front of Pharaoh, turned into a, turned into a snake, right? Of course, the, the magicians for Egypt, they threw theirs down. Theirs turned into snakes, but then Aaron's ate up all of theirs, saying that, hey, this is the number one. So that rod represents the power and presence of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the disciples, wait, and actually everyone, wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power by the Holy Spirit. We need, you and I, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God. We need to be reminded that God is our strength and our provider. That's what that ark, that ark represents the presence. We need, to, we need to be reminded that God is the one who takes care of us. Look at the obvious blessings that the Obed Edom enjoyed in his life. You know, here's King David up in the capital city, and he hears about this guy, Obed Edom, that he gave him the ark. It's only been three months, and the guy's blessed incredibly, right? So, first of all, Obed-Edom, because of all this, he got promoted. He got promoted. 
First Chronicles 16, verses 4 and 5. Talking about David said that he, David, King David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, then Jael, Shemarimoth, Jehiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, and lo and behold, there's Obed. He just got promoted. Can you imagine him going home to his family there in Gath, saying, hey, guess what? We're going to the big city. We're like, they probably left the Beverly Hills, like, man, we're going to LA, or we're going to Hollywood, or whatever, right? Load up the truck, because we got promoted. He got promoted to go up to the big city, to go up to, to ministry. Not only that, but in 1 Chronicles 26, verses 4 and 5, we find out that his whole family Less. Look at First Chronicles 26. Moreover, so in addition, the sons of Obed Edom were Shemaiah the firstborn, Jehoshaphat the second, Joah the third, Zechariah the fourth, Nethanel the fifth, Amiel the sixth, Issachar the seventh, and Pulthai the eighth, for God blessed him. Eight sons he blesses. God had blessed his life. Not only him for saying yes to God. When we say yes to God, it, it affects our family. It affects the people around us. Not always right away, but we have an effect. And I always like to say that, uh, that I, I think that, and there's all kinds of testimonies here, but you think God will pick, will choose one person in the family and they'll get saved first because they are kind of the key to the rest of the family. In some way they connect the rest of the family. In some way they reach out, they, they draw others to it. So not only was Obed Edom, but his family was blessed. Not only that, look at the next verse, 1 Chronicles 16, 38. And Obed-Edom with his 68 brethren, family members, brethren, including Obed-Edom, the son of Jedithon and Hosah, to be gatekeepers. Not only was he blessed, not only was his immediate family, his entire household, his entire family structure was blessed because one man said, yes, I want God's presence in my life. I want to invite him in. I know I'm taking a risk. I know it's, I know bad things have happened to some other people, but I'm willing to do that. And then lastly, he moved, talk about Obed, Edom, he moved on with God when God moved. Sometimes we want to get set in our ways. And the children of Israel, when they were out in the wilderness for 40 years, they had this pillar of fire at night, and they had the pillar of the cloud by day to protect them. And when that cloud moved, they moved. When that cloud stayed stationary, they stayed stationary. Sometimes I can get too comfortable where I'm at, and I have to be willing to move when God moves. I have to be willing to move when God moves. So how does this relate to us? Let's look at some scriptures talking about what God's desire is for each of us. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God's looking for people to bless. God's looking for people to use for his kingdom purposes. The Bible says in John 4 that he's looking for worshipers. We're called to be worshipers. Really probably our highest calling as a, as, a, as a believer, as a Christian, whatever your terminology, is to be a worshiper of the Most High God. But it's taken me, for me, it's taken me a long time to figure that out. I just want to tell you, it's taken me decades. I didn't really kind of get that. I got saved, and I, stuck, I would come to church towards the end of worship. I didn't understand singing the same song over and over again. Like, what's that? I thought that was kind of dumb. So I would conveniently get there when worship was almost over because I had I was I was a neophyte. I didn't understand. I was I was young. I didn't I didn't get it. So it's taken God a long time. Now I realize that's the best part. The worship is the best part. If, if you missed the first the first you know, 20, 30 minutes, the, you, you missed the best part. This is, you know, this is kind of mop up. But that, that was it. You know, worshiping God, enjoying Him. We're called to be worshipers of God. 
We're called to be disciples of God, to be learner followers of Jesus. And when we see what's going on in our culture, in our, in our, in our country, and in the church, the, the church is drifting away from the things of God. So just so you know, I'll be talking to somebody, but in probably the end of September, we're going to, be, we're going to start up our foundations course again. And even if you've been through it before, they say every five to seven years, you should take a foundation series just to get yourself grounded in the Word of God. So I encourage you to think about it. So we need to be worshipers. We need to be disciples. We have to reach other people. You know, just like you and I were lost one day without the Lord. People around us, there's family members, there's friends, there's neighbors, co workers, fellow students, they're lost. We need to reach those people. Next, Isaiah 48 17 says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. You know, as a young man, I had things planned out. I had goals, and I was kind of driven, blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't submitting myself to God. And I'll tell you what, God's plans are so much better. I can't even conceive of a plan that compares to what God's plan is. I can't always see it right now in this life, but we're going to stand before God in eternity. We're going to look back and go, whoa, wow. Lord, that's pretty incredible. I didn't even see that myself. I didn't realize it when I just obeyed you in this area that affected a bunch of other people. I didn't realize that, Lord, at the time. I thought it was just a small little thing. God used it as a big thing. So God will lead you. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his ways. There's a famous proverb, I don't have it here, but Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. It's okay to plan. I'm not saying it's bad to have goals, but we need to submit those to the Lord. Because his ways are higher than our ways. I don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, let alone a month, a year, ten years, but God does. God does. And then lastly, Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's why it's so important for you and I to read and to study and to meditate and to memorize the Word of God. It's, it, it will bring light to your path. It will, God will show you what direction your life is to take as we base our lives upon the Word of God. And as we uh, we'll get ready to close today, I think there are probably some people here today that uh, you need to say, you have to decide if you're going to say yes to God. Now, sometimes we, we say, well, I'm, I'm not going to make that decision right yet. And I, I respect that. I was just, um, we were with some friends, and I was re reminded of a, a lady in the church that we were at previously. And I remember feeling impressed to approach her about her walk with God. I remember presenting to her you know, what, what God's expectations were. And after I kind of laid it out to her, I didn't, I didn't want to candy coat it, didn't want to promise her a bunch of things, but I, I wanted to show her what God's expectations are. Um, she said she wasn't ready yet. She said she wasn't ready to make that commitment. I thought I was a little disappointed. And down the road, several months later, she did, did make that commitment. But I appreciated her honesty. And I appreciated the fact that she knew that she was making a decision, that she was saying no, right, at that point in time. And that's what we're really saying. When we tell God, when we feel God's prompting us, and we say, well, I'm going to think about it some more, but what I'm really saying is no. Right now I'm saying no. It may change, but I'm saying no. And I just think we just need to, be, we just need to realize that. that. We're saying no, especially if God calls us to an area of obedience. And we go, oh, I don't know if I'm going to do that yet. I'm, I'm saying no for right now. And hopefully I'll have another opportunity to say yes. I think there, today, I think there there are people saying yes. And I think there are some people today that sometimes we feel like, you know, our walk with God is a one and done. Well, I prayed that prayer. I prayed the prayer of salvation. I'm done. Well, no. It's a constant walk with God. And really, there are many yeses throughout life. And I think there are some people here today that God is asking you to say yes once again to Him and to His calling and purpose for your life. 
some of us, are, we struggle with our, our thoughts and our, our minds and having that kingdom mentality. And I think if, if we'll say, Lord, I want to seek first your kingdom, I think he'll open up our understanding. We may be struggling why things are happening or why did this happen in my life or why this didn't happen. But if I'll just commit myself to the Lord, put my trust in him, God will help me to see it through his eyes. Now, I'm not saying he's going to show us everything, but if we ask him, God will help us to see things through his eyes today. Why don't you stand with me? I'll, I'll close this with a prayer. And, uh, you can have your own conversation. I'm up here talking, and I'll be praying just a second, but having your own conversation right now with the Lord. I know the Lord is speaking to different people about different circumstances. Lord, first of all, I just want to say that we, we as a people are in awe of you <coughs> and your incredible love. And Lord, as we look back and we see the lives of these people that said yes to God, Lord, thank you for that encouragement. Lord, whether we are young in life, whether we're kind of more towards the middle, middle ages of our life, or those that are nearing more that the, the, the latter years, Lord, we just know that no matter what stage, you're still speaking to us. You're still calling, and I just pray that people's hearts would be opened up and would give you that that yes. And yet, Lord, we know it's risky. It's risky to say yes to God. That, Lord, there is no one like you. There is nothing that compares to the plan and purpose of God. And there is no one more trustworthy than you. But, God, you never have an ulterior motive. People have misled us. People have maybe used us in ways for their own benefit. But, God, you never do that. Your desire is always for our best. So, Lord, let that blessed assurance come to people today that are struggling they would be able to give you that yes and say, I'm going to walk in the way I'm going to trust God in this situation knowing that God is for me and is with me. Thank you, Lord, for your word that changes our hearts and lives. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be a, a people of faith, a praying people. As we pray today, we're acknowledging that, God, you are there and you hear the prayers of us as your people. Thank you for that. And Lord, as we leave here today, I know that, God, you go with us. We don't leave the presence of God in a building that you are ever with us. And so as every person walks out of here today, my prayers would just be a greater awareness of you, your love for them, and your plan and purpose for their lives. And they're not hidden, Lord, it doesn't matter where they're from, where they live at, whether it's in the city or the rural area, whether they're rich or poor, God, you see every life, you know every situation, and you can be trusted. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to go in your name. Lord, as we go, thank you for the opportunity to be givers into your kingdom. Thank you that, Lord, as we give of our finances, we're saying we want you to be honored and we want other people to come to know you. That's why we give, Lord. We see people, as we give today, we see people being touched by the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be like our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. Thank you that we can emulate you. Thank you that we can go in your strength. Thank you for your wonderful peace and presence today. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine. It's going to be hot one this week. Go in the Lord.